today to talk to you about informatics and health information management and all of those things. And those are embedded in me for the rest of my life because that's where I've spent my career. But today I really want to speak to you as a parent, just someone who experiences the healthcare system on a regular basis. Um, oh gosh, so many years ago, my children are now 16 and 18, we adopted Grace and Zach from the state of Louisiana. They were two and four at the time and they were siblings. They were two of five children and uh, we adopted them. They didn't come with an instruction booklet and they didn't come with medical records. So when uh, we adopted them, the state of Louisiana said, there are a few little issues with asthma and allergies and you'll want to take them and get those things checked out. And so we did and we went to a pediatric asthma and allergy specialist. Grace was probably three, Zach five. Imagine going into a tiny little room with two children. And before we went in, the doctor told me to make sure you take them off all single air, all clear necks. You don't want to do the allergy testing on them. And I'm adopted, and so every time I've taken my children to the doctor, I've always said when they go into the family medical history, I always say, well, you know, the children are adopted, and we don't have any family medical history available to share with you. We do know that there was a grandmother with breast cancer. Uh, we don't have any more information uh, than that, other than um, when we adopted them, they said they had asthma or allergies, severe al allergies, possibly asthma. And of course, that was diagnosed in my son and my daughter early on. So we're in the doctor's office, and I always go through the same thing. And the doctor's using the electronic medical record, and they are keying all of this information in. Zach takes the allergy uh, tests and. You know, they're both in there, and he lights up like a Christmas tree, and Grace has no response. So the doctor turns to me, and he says, and he has no idea what I do or, you know, what the day job is, and he says, well, you've given her, you've given her clarinet, and she's not responding, and this, this whole thing is just a wash. Just go home with these children. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why in the world would I give one of my children the medication and not the other? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And so I ask a lot of questions. We go back. He never tests her again. Fast forward later in life, she dances quite a bit. Grace does. And she's on a competition team and was getting probably about 15 hours of exercise a week. But she was still getting these upper respiratory things quite often and just just really having some trouble and our uh, general practitioner says, look, we've got to change specialists. You've got to go to something else. I'm convinced there's something going on with this kid. We go in, we do an asthma test. He says, let's just send her for a sweat test. And I'm like, why would we want to do like a sweat test, you know? And, and he says, just take her for the sweat test. Well, she was positive for cystic fibrosis. As a parent, I thought, what, how did I miss this? Well, all the dancing was helping clean her, clear her lungs. She was staying well. We were pretty active about, you know, being healthy at, at our home. We managed the asthma and allergy, but she never, they diagnosed and said she never had asthma. She never had allergies at all. And so as we embarked, I kept asking myself, I thought, you know, what did we miss? What did we do wrong? I go back and... They said, well, you can go to, um, you know, there's a local place that sees cystic fibrosis patients. You might want to check out and see who ranks well throughout the United States. Um, you know, we, we really need to get her involved because at this time she's age 11. And so we found a place in Houston, Texas Children's Hospital. At that time they were ranked number three in the nation. I thought, well, that's, that's where we want to go. How do I get her in? Well, I call the case managers and all of these things. And you know, I have a little bit of knowledge, but think about the general patient. They may not share the same knowledge. And they say, well, if she comes in through the ER, then she can be seen. They'll catch the diagnosis. I said, Gracie, let's go shopping in Houston. <laughs> let's just go shopping in Houston. And while you're there, by the way, you're going to have a little asthma attack. I'm going to take you through the ER. <laughs> They're going to confirm this diagnosis, and you're going to get to be a patient at Texas Children's. And she said, that would be lying and no. <laughs> and I said, well, okay then. So the case manager calls me back and they're fascinated that she has this history and she's undiagnosed. And 
um, and they want to see her. And so they tell me to collect all of her health information. And so I start going back to create records. One of the things that we found from that original asthma and allergy doctor was a copy paste, copy forward error from the very first day that she was taken to the clinic that said, the mother states there is no inherited or family medical, uh, genetic family medical history or illnesses to be noted. The period, there was like a comma period space. It was copy forward and copy paste from the very first visit all the way until the child was 11 years old. And I'm thinking, I have all this knowledge, right? I get up in front of students. At that time, I was a professor at Louisiana Tech, head of the Center of Data Analytics. What do you think I'm teaching those students? The importance of accurate data. The importance of patient engagement. Telling patients to check their records. As a health information manager, I, I, I just couldn't believe how could I miss, how could I not ask those questions? As a parent, I felt as though I failed because all of that time we had spent going to this doctor, had I just reviewed that medical record maybe just one time, could I have possibly gotten him to reevaluate her? Now see, a lot of people might say, well, the doctor should have figured this out. I say no. As a parent, I should have figured that out. More importantly, I am armed and equipped with that knowledge, and I didn't use it. I didn't ask any questions. So we fast forward and we start creating medical records. So we have those records. In the process of transferring all of the, all of the visits over, we find all kinds of indicators along the way in reviewing the medical documentation that could raise some flags that maybe there's something else going on other than asthma and allergies. We created some medical records from claims data. The hospital in Houston was really insistent on give me every piece of information you can, you can find and you can gather. And so we made this nice chronological history of what was going on with Grace. When we arrived at Texas Children's, I had a doctor's office that had not gathered the records. We had films in hand, and I want you to listen carefully to what I'm saying. I have paper records. So here's the health information manager informaticist with paper records and x-rays and films and prescriptions. And yes, the patient with the um, Ziploc bag of inhalers and all the things, and here I am. All the things that I've told people there are better ways to do this, I am now that person on the other side of healthcare, and I know better. At the hotel, the doctor's office calls and they said, look, we didn't get those records to you, but we have them now, we're gonna fax them over. The hotel says, we periodically receive things like this. We have a dedicated area. We were in the Houston Medical Park, and I thought, wow, you have like a dedicated area? We can't just do this email or Something, I found that to be just a little bit odd, right? So I said, what the heck, okay? Not once, not twice, but three times they faxed those records to a gas station. For <laughs> <laughs> medical records. My goodness, let's be glad she was 11 years old and her social security number or other data wasn't on there and that these are trustworthy people. But not once, not twice, but three times they sent those records. She still picks up records to this day. And I guess what I'm saying is, because I have to be brief, because I have to let her speak to you, right? Mm -hmm. Is for us, we assume a lot. We believe that the practitioner is gonna engage with the patient, but we have created a healthcare system that doesn't allow time for that. And some of those what I would call efficiencies in care delivery. If you go to the doctor's office now, many times the doctor does the evaluation and has a conversation with the patient, but when there are 50 other people out in the lobby waiting to be seen, and we're at the end of the day, what do you believe will happen? How much patient-generated health data do you believe gets shared with that physician? 
If it was sent in earlier, how much of that do you believe they've had time to read and really evaluate before the care begins? It's often not much. So I'm going to introduce my daughter Grace to you, and she has a different philosophy. Uh, a few years back, I uh, was uh, speaking at the ONC, and Grace sent word, she was probably 12 then, to Karen DeSalvo, that she was really tired of having to go and get x-rays before she went to Houston. And that when she turned 20, she was coming back to the ONC, and she was going to tell them how she felt about interoperability. Now, we hear that that's widespread and it's there, and we can access our records at any time. But I can tell you, as a 16-year-old consumer, she picks up her own medical records. Most people know me. They know her. She presents her driver's license, and she takes care of it. She also documents her own care. We have two children in the North Louisiana that live probably within a couple of miles with, um, from us. One is a 19-year-old staff positive post bond pain. Uh, left side. He has his own set of challenges, including liver failure. We were all going somewhere in the car together. He starts talking about going to the doctor and how his mom coordinates all of that, and she said, you should be coordinating that yourself. <laughs> Do you not know your medicines? Well, I know some of them, Grace, and she said, well, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> And she starts talking to him about, hey, you're 19 years, years old and your parents are going to turn you out into the real world and you need to know these things. We assume that our children won't understand, but I, I can tell you if I need something fixed on my iPhone or my computer, I turn it over to them because they far can do it faster than I can because they just see things differently in the world and with technology. So, you know, she, we have another neighbor who is uh, diabetic and she has a pump and Gracie took her to Texas Children's and she said, I want you to see my patient experience. I don't want you to go to the doctor with me. I want to share with you my patient experience. And she went and I think she was very amazed. But she also watched Grace because when we go into the doctor's office, these visits could be about six hours. I sit down and I am just really trying to hang on for the ride and take as many notes as I can. Sometimes I just ask, can I record? Um, because it's too much and I forget things, but I am not telling them anything about her. She does all that work. I have no doubt that when she goes to college and goes out on her own, she will be able to take care of herself. She's found medication errors in her electronic record. She periodically communicates with her practitioners across the board, and we're not talking about one doctor, we're talking about many doctors and nurse practitioners. She does all of these things. I'm just impressed because at 16, I could have cared less about getting up in front of a group of people and speaking, and so I think she's pretty stinking brave, even if she is mom, <laughs> to do this, to share her story. So I'm going to let her kick off now and kind of tell you some of the things that she's, uh, she does for herself. Thank you. Good morning. I want to thank you all for inviting me to share my story this morning. I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at the age of 11. I'm now 16 years old. Uh, I'm a patient at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. When uh, between every visit, I go to each doctor, family, family physician that I've gone to to get my medical records. And like she said, I go in, she drops me off at the door at half the time, and I walk in, I'm like, okay, I need my medical records. And they're like, how do you get? I'm like, I'm 16, I need my medical records. And I'm like, okay, I need your ID. I was like, here. I mean, I have everything planned out, ready to give to them. And, I go back home, as soon as I get home, I start highlighting stuff. The day, what every medicine says, everything. Um, I'm doing well. Most CF patients go between every month to every three months. I go every six months. And like my mom said, my doctor's visits last pretty long. We go in about 10 in the morning and I get out about five in the afternoon and I get an hour break for lunch. 
between my uh, pulmonary function test was seeing seven other doctors, that's including the main doctor. I have a nutritionist, a dietitian, um, pulmonologist, the main doctor I see, and I'm missing some, but I can't name them more off the top of my head right now. Um, help, we also communicate through email, telephone, whatever way I can get in touch with her the fastest when I get sick. Um, like my mom said, we collect a lot of data. Half the time when I'm sitting there, get ready, get ready to do the pulmonary function test, she's sitting there with the video, get ready. She's like, okay. And she starts and they're like, I'm telling you, I get screamed up that 20 times during one test. And luckily, my mine are around 92%. Uh, right now, a lot of CF patients aren't that well. Um, last year, I accessed the my chart that Texas children size, and I was going there and checking everything. This was a during a period of time where I had been out in the hospital for a week and then um, I was out of school for three months because there's flu in school and then there's some fat bug going around and then there's flu again in school. So I had to stay away from all that. And she was in just at the tech and I was in uh, one of the student worker rooms. I was like, I was just looking at stuff, doing homework. I was like, okay, I'm going to uh, check the mantra. I have to go in a few months. Pulled it up. I was like, "What are these medicines in my uh, chart?" And I went there. I was like, "I know every medicine I take." And I was sitting there. I was looking at them. And so I went and told mom. I wrote down. I was like, "By the way, I'm going to email my doctor right now to um, get these medicines taken off the list. Just to let you know what I'm doing, just in case she shows you, texts you that." Uh, I emailed her. I was like, she said, okay, go do it. And so immediately after about an hour, the nurse takes a uh, response back and she says, okay, we will get those taken off immediately. Next thing I know, all taken off. Then it's been correct since then. Um, my medical records and everything supports my IEP at school. And so this really helps when I go to the doctor and when I'm at school because a lot of times there'll be like a kid getting sick and I'll be like, okay mom, I need the, I need a mask. Um, about a month ago, I was uh, at school and I heard a friend, uh, she got the flu. I was like, I'm gonna get a flu shot. I'll, I'll text my doctor, I've got the physician right then. And I said, I'm gonna get a flu shot. I'll be back at school. Just let the teachers know. I texted, I told the principal, they're like, okay, you can go do that. I came back and I had to wear a mask at school for two weeks. And I asked the point, well, I thought I was going to be down for my mask during football season because I'm a cheerleader and so I wanted to show some spirit and ended up not getting time to do that. Um, documentation at home is very important. Uh, all sectors of the healthcare industry are responding to address the needs of the consumer and for industry driven data collection purposes. The apps used to track health and wellness are rapidly growing. At this moment, I don't track, I don't, I re do research all the apps because I don't necessarily trust all those apps yet. Um, but I'm slowly getting to the apps that I know will help me. Um, many com companies collect data and sell that data for other purposes. I'm in enough research studies and I like to determine who uses my data and what they use it for. I use a tablet, notebook, or my phone, whichever is easiest for me to use at the time, um, to journal my food intake, liquid intake, the medicines. Um, I take how I feel during the day and my sleep patterns. All of these notes are used to determine my uh, plan for wellness. I have to be a lot, a lot rides on the data that data I collect. In fact, my health depends on it. My writing for a period is not just a document on the shelf or words stored in an electric file. It is my saving grace. Consumers 
must be actively engaged with the provider. I'm 16 years old and I'm a digitally literate consumer. I expect easy access to all my records. I expect my provider to listen to changes when I provide them. I expect my provider to use the information that I collect and share. And I expect my provider to acknowledge my questions and concerns. I expect my provider to recognize that I'm paying for the most important, most expensive service that I will ever purchase, and that is my health. <coughs> Our library uh, health system that recognizes the importance of patient-generated health data is critical to my care. My records are used by my doctors, my teachers, and more importantly, by me. Health information where and when you need it is not changing lives, it's saving them. Thank you. or integrate or do any, uh, get any value from information about your school system and your school performance and your school records connected to your health records or do you have to manually crosswalk all of that yourself? Um, I get all of my medical records from Houston yep. when I go and I get from all the doctors and I like combine them and put information also, Texas Children sends my IEP to school. Good. They make an IEP for me to send to school. That helps explain everything, but also all the teachers know me yeah. and know all, and so it helps. And I'm like, and I'm just sitting there, and they're like, okay, what are, what do you need to do today? What do you need to take treatment? Because I've taken treatments at school before. I'm gone in the nurse's office and sat there and taking treatments when I'm sick. So I'm guessing the answer to your question, are they integrated electronically? And the answer to that is no. Uh, in North Louisiana, we have school nurses through, throughout the school system, but they're, they're not, uh, there are no electronic records. However, the fortunate of that is superintendent of schools, and they are <laughs> of, uh, uh, electronic records for the hospital system is going to uh, put those in, and so it'll be integrated in part. But in terms of interoperability and those being shared into a record system, that does not exist. It also doesn't exist within the state of Louisiana, so foster children, right. adopted children, um, those records don't follow them, and it's really up to the parent um, to to gain access and to maintain those records on their behalf. Can you scream? Thank you, sure. Thank you to both of you, first of all, for sharing your story. After all that you've been through and sort of the terms that you have with maybe records not being passed on as they should have been reported, do you feel at this point that you actually are partners with your healthcare providers, like uh, sort of trusted partners, or do you think you're still at the point of getting over some of those you know, earlier downers? I think it depends on where we are and in which environment and which with which doctor. So universally, the answer is no. Uh, she is, I mean, she takes all the things in. She really doesn't give them a choice. Um, when, when we get in the if, when we get in the doctor's office, it's really amazing. Um, doesn't matter if it's the nurse, if it's the social worker. Really doesn't matter. They don't. You know, I'm sort of invisible. Really, I sign the consents, uh, but their interaction is with her, and she provides them. She starts and if they don't ask her about her food intake or her weight maintenance. I mean, they, they, they weigh her, right? And they do all those things. And of course, her cystic fibrosis, I don't know how familiar you are with the disease, but um, she's really incredible in terms of lung functions and weights and all those things. But a, a lot of that is her education, um, what she does to, to learn about the disease, manage the disease, um, 
it, it's really incredible, and they know this. So when she comes in, if they don't ask her, she starts telling them. Uh, and she, she doesn't wait to be asked important questions about diet, exercise, weight management, clearance, uh, how she feels, illness, and those kind of things. Um, she just doesn't, and they know that. So she doesn't give them the opportunity to be passive or complacent, and she, because she's not. Now, in other settings, she struggles because if we ever, we try to avoid hospitals, of course, and emergency rooms because that's where the germs do live still. But also, when you encounter a different provider outside of the research network, she gets very frustrated, um, almost angry when someone walks in uh, in an ER or in a doctor's office and they haven't changed and put on um, sterile clothing because they can transport germs to her and she very politely asks them to leave. And I can tell you in some settings that hasn't been really acceptable and she just says, well, if you really understand cystic fibrosis, now tell the doctor that, right? <laughs> then you know that you can't come near me because I don't wanna be sicker when I leave than when I got here. So she's very polite about that. But um, in terms of the, the back and forth and the collaboration, it does not exist across the board. In terms of the information sharing, uh, that does not exist across the board. I do think it's improving, uh, but we are not there yet. We have a long way to go. I think we assume providers know these things and, and that this is gonna happen, but we have a lot more education that we gotta learn. Just, just one quick question. Do you, for your regular doctors, do you consider yourself like all of them part of one team or are there really many different ones where you're sort of the hub? Yeah. What's the answer to that? What do you think? Um, how's it for me to work with my third office? Do they all work together? Or? Yes, they do. Um, I went to the hospital. I came home from Texas Children's last, this, following spring and I ended up having the flu. Came home from this very important doctor and um, doctor's visit and I came home with the flu and so my uh, local doctor was has been communicating with my doctor in Houston ever since then. We got our number, we got, a, we got our email for her, and they communicate every time I go in, every time I go out what the diagnosis is, no matter what it is, they do communicate through the telephone and email. So I'll give you an example. This is kind of um, interesting. She, so many times with one autoimmune, you discover another. So right now she's having also some renal issues where she dehydrates and she goes in for a lot of IV fluids. It's, it's kind of unusual when she starts to dehydrate, she gets this perfect butterfly rash across her face um, before the before the lab ever detects dehydration, before anything happens, this rash occurs. And so she knows she starts to get a severe headache. Um, she's a pretty tough kid. At one point she had um, her white blood cells were zero. They thought she was septic and her symptom was she had a headache uh, and was still at school and still going 100. So, um, so, so with her, she, she really has to be tuned in. So she dehydrated, we went into the emergency room. The practitioner that was on call, she starts telling, telling him, I know I'm dehydrating. She's taking pictures of herself. She's sending it out to her, the, the pulmonologist in um, Texas, Dr. Stockwater. He, he finally just gives up with her. He says, get Texas Children's on the phone for me, find Dr. Marion Sockrider, and I need to talk to her. And so when they bring the phone in, they hand it to her. And this is the physician, and she starts going off with all of the things that's happening, hands the phone back to the ER doctor, and he says, well, she's dehydrated and we're gonna give her fluids. <laughs> and she says, yeah. <laughs> so, so yes, there is coordination of care. And, but it's not, uh, <laughs> so take that for what it's worth, right? But, but with her regular team that she sees locally, the nurse practitioner and the physician there, yes, it is highly coordinated care. And they are talking and emailing and texting and doing all these things. I know I just said texting, right? On a regular basis uh, at every visit. So she's got the stop sign. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>